Hey everyone, and welcome to Element again for another week. Uh, I'm going to be doing our Bible reading, which comes from Hosea chapter 13. And we're going to be starting at verse 9. Okay, so Hosea 13, starting at verse 9. Are you a destroyed Israel because you are against me, against your helper? Where is your king that he may save you? Where are your rulers in all your towns of whom you said, give me king and princes? So in my anger, I gave you a king and in my wrath, I took him away. The guilt of Ephraim is stored up. His sins are kept on record. Pains of a woman in childbirth come to him, but he is a child without wisdom. When the time arrives, he doesn't have the sense to come out of the womb. I will deliver this people from the power of the grave. I will redeem them from death. Where, O oh death, are your plagues? Where, O oh death, is your destruction? Hey, everyone. I've just been reflecting this week about uh, how quickly life can change. I mean, would you think that a year ago that we'd be where we are right now in the world? Even September last year, it didn't seem like there was a lot of problems in our lives. There was no bushfires. There was no COVID. Life was really good. And then COVID came and our life seemed to change overnight. Governments around the world struggled to work out what to do and governments, some governments even hid the true problem of the virus. And life got canceled and everything changed, didn't it? This week, just when COVID was starting to get back to normal, life changed really quickly. Again, the world went into uproar about the horrible murder of George Floyd and the underlying issues of police brutality, poor leadership and racial injustice. And there were many who were ready to ask the important questions. Why is this happening? Why is the world the way that it is? When will our lives matter as much as everyone else's? When will things change for the better? But there were many more who were ready to take advantage of the situation, to smash windows, to loot businesses, and to set fire to anything that would burn. It was really shocking to see. People seemed to change in an instant. Law-abiding citizens suddenly became violent looters. And in response, police took to the streets and they too had changed. There were scenes of police pushing old men to the ground, slashing car tires, hitting the media standing nearby, tear gas filling the air. It was just a failure on both sides. There were the police called to serve and protect citizens, standing against a crowd of people called to obey the law and pursue peace with their government. There was no unity to be seen. And things really do need to change in our world before we can say that life is good again. This week I heard someone on Facebook or read someone on Facebook say, I question whether this world is worth saving when I see all the evils going on in it. And it's an important question, isn't it? Why fight to change things when it seems to make no difference? Maybe you felt this way too. Is this world worth saving? Is the world worth changing? Do you think God sees it this way too? Does God see the world as worth saving? You know, if we can get so angry and furious with the injustice and evil in our world, how does God feel? How does he react? Is he powerless to fix it like we are? Is he powerless to change our world? There are many different voices out there that tell us that we can change this world. We can make a difference. And I believe that we have the potential in us to do so many and change so many things in our world. But today, as we look at Hosea 13, I want us to see that God doesn't just have the power to change, but he has the power to restore. Well, as we've traveled through Hosea, we've seen the kind of nation that Israel was. For them, life was 2019. It was comfortable and life was great. But God had seen something in Israel that had changed and that something was really wrong. And chapter 13 gives us this snapshot of Israel. And we've seen it in previous weeks, but look with me at verse six. God says, when I fed them, they were satisfied. When they were satisfied, they became proud, and then they forgot me. God saw that Israel's heart had changed. He'd given them so much, but they had forgotten him, the one who cared for them and the one who had fed them. And last week, Rachel painted this picture of God as a father who loved Israel like his own son. But Israel had left God behind and sought to live their own life. And their life took a drastic change as well. Look with me at verse 2. They sin more and more. They make idols for themselves from their silver, cleverly fashioned images, all of them the work of craftsmen. It is said of these people, they offer human sacrifice, 
they kiss calf idols. Well, Israel had found new gods to worship. And because of this, their behavior had changed. They sin more and more, and they even commit human sacrifice, and their behavior has set them up for destruction. And our world is in the exact same situation. Our world has turned its back on God and has forgotten Him. And we see the consequences of our own rebellion against Him. The desire to do what we want to do has led to racism, violence, hatred, abuse of power, bad leadership, corrupt police, looting, and so many others. Does the condition of the world grieve you? Does it make you feel hopeless? Well, in verse 14, God makes a great promise to Israel. He says, I will deliver this people from the power of the grave. I will redeem them from death. Where, O death, are your plagues? Where, O grave, is your destruction? Well, here to Israel, God begins to speak hope. And as we read through these lines, we might be tempted to just think of physical death. I know I did when I first read this passage. You know, God's promising us eternal life. God's promising to spare Israel. Yes, he is, but there is so much more to that. See, when Israel was destroyed and were taken away as prisoners in chains, they wrote songs of lament. And the word lament means a passionate expression of grief or sorrow. The songs were a cry to God to speed his plans, to hurry up and not to wait, but to bring the joy and the restoration that he had promised to save them from the despair of what was lost. And so Israel wept together. And as they grieved, they were reminded of God's promises. They were reminded of their need for him and their hope in him began to grow. You see, God was gonna bring joy out of despair. God was gonna bring unity out of destruction. God was gonna bring life out of death. God was gonna bring laughter out of sorrow. God was gonna bring peace out of chaos. Is that a promise just for heaven? Is that the good news of Jesus that we are sharing with people? Just wait until your life's over and then things will be better. No, I know that what we have to offer is much more than just hopeful words of a better place beyond this world. We have been called to offer so much more. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul quotes from Hosea as he writes to encourage those who are waiting in despair for God's return. In verse 51, he says, Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. In a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, the perishable has been clothed in the imperishable and the mortal with immortality. And then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourself fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Well, Paul's audience were sitting around waiting for Jesus to return, expecting him to come really soon. But Paul didn't encourage them to do that. Well, our world is broken and the people in it have turned their back on God. And the time is coming when Jesus will return and death will be swallowed up in victory completely. But until that time, we are called to do more. We're not here sitting around waiting for the big escape. We are called to give ourselves fully to the work of the Lord. But what is the work of the Lord? Hosea has shown it, hasn't it? I will deliver this people from the power of the grave. I will redeem them from death. Where a death are your plagues, where a grave is your destruction. Our gospel is only worth believing if it confronts the evils in this fallen world and if it comforts those who are suffering. Just changing our world isn't gonna save people from their sins, yes, but if we do know Jesus, if we have a relationship with him, we should see the pain of people around us and we should say, what can I do? We are called to mourn with those who mourn, to share the pain of those around us, to listen to the anger and sorrow of those caught in injustice and to speak for those without a voice. We're called to be a light in our communities, to live out the very unity we are longing for on earth and to hold out to others the true and lasting hope that heaven and unity with God himself awaits us at the end. How do we be a light? Jesus commands us to love our neighbors as we love ourselves. To illustrate this point, Jesus used the example of a Samaritan man helping an Israelite man. These were two people from two completely different walks of life who had every cultural and social reason to be enemies with each other. But instead of ignoring the need, the Samaritan man bound up the Israelite's wound, paid for his medical care and promised to return and see him again. This is what loving our neighbor looks like. Loving our neighbors means loving the stranger, loving the outcast, loving the rejected, loving the oppressed, loving the enemy, yes, even loving the racist. 
and looking past every difference in life and appearance and seeing them as someone made in the image of God. We serve a God who delights in human dignity and the worth of every person in the world. So we need to love people in a way that reflects that. And we can be a light by praying. We have a God who hears our every word and who knows our very hearts. So we should start by praying for ourselves. The prayer of David in Psalm 139 is a great prayer to pray. It says, search me God and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. When our hearts are right with God and we're praying to him, we are lights in the world by the words that we speak and the things that we do. So we should pray also for our leaders, pray for the ones suffering and pray for the enemy that God would work in their lives so that they would know him and find their identity in him. So let us do the work of the Lord. Let us share the good news of Jesus and let us do this without being discouraged because as we do this, we will grow in the certainty that the wounds of racism will be healed and that the unity and joy of heaven is not far. Revelation 7 captures a small glimpse of heaven. And what do you see when I read this? Verse nine, after this I looked and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people and language standing before the throne and before the lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. And they cried out in a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the lamb. Lord, may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Amen.